Mrs. Kristalina, thank you for being again on the show. Um, let's begin by discussing the global economic outlook. Do you think that the United States will manage a soft landing despite one of its most aggressive monetary tightening cycles in recent history? It looks very likely that uh, the U.S. will avoid recession. Uh, in fact, what we see is the Fed policy of tightening is bearing fruits. Inflation has been slowing down. Core inflation in recent months almost at target. Uh, but of course, we should not forget that there are new pressures like oil prices going up. Uh, nonetheless, uh, with consumer being strong, labor market being exceptionally strong, uh, the US is in a position to achieve soft lending. How about uh, Europe? Uh, economic indicators are weakening in the face of higher uh, borrowing costs. Are you concerned about the economic outlook there? In comparison to the US, uh, the European economy uh, faces more headwinds. Why? Because it is much more dependent than the US on import of energy. And that has been a shock to which countries uh, needed to adapt. Uh, what we see, however, is that similar to uh, the US, uh, consumer demand remains resilient and labor markets in Europe remain resilient. It is true that the EU, the Eurozone is behind the US in terms of inflation going down to target. Uh, we believe that it would take all the way through 2024 for this to happen, but in the Eurozone as well, the trend is going in the right direction. Inflation is going down. What is critical for uh, the uh, Eurozone is to accelerate this adjustment to a new energy mix uh, and step up on the pedal on transi tra transitioning to the green economy that is going to bring new opportunities for jobs and grow, and grow to Europe. Also, Europe needs to tackle its uh, demographic uh, problem. Aging, some countries shrinking, that requires a thoughtful use of labor. And also, as Germany is doing, bringing more uh, people from outside uh, to help fill the demand uh, in this very tight labor market. Higher for longer is the theme that we are hearing from both the Fed and the ECB. Do you think the priority should stay on uh, fighting inflation versus supporting growth? Uh, bringing inflation down is because we want growth to strengthen. Uh, our projections for growth are weak. We expect global growth at around 3% over the next five years. This is almost a percentage point below the average of the previous uh, decade. Inflation by throwing cold water on consumer and investor confidence actually is an obstacle to growth. And this is why the fight against inflation is number one priority. We see that there are positive results the trend globally is down, but uh, we expect that inflation would remain in most countries above target all the way through next year. So interest rates will have to remain tight. Our advice to central banks, one, be vigilant. Two, be data dependent. Three, communicate clearly your intentions to build more confidence. How about Asia? We have heard from the World Bank that Asia is heading towards one of its worst economic outlooks in half a century due to the weakening uh, Chinese economy. Do you share the same gloomy picture on that region? And how worried are you about China in particular? Well, when, when you look at uh, the uh, world outlook, yes, the world economy has proven remarkably resilient to two unthinkable shocks, but there is a price that is paid everywhere. Slow and uneven recovery. When we look at Asia, 
vis-a-vis -vis pre pandemic projections, most of Asia is some four, five percent below where it would have been if COVID and the war didn't happen. So there is scarring that is affecting Asia. And in addition to that, with rethinking of supply chains, with some country specific difficulties like in uh, China, the real estate uh, crisis, this is adding to troubles in part of parts of Asia. But Asia is not uniform. If you look at Indonesia or India, very healthy uh, growth, very dynamic uh, growth, and also inflation brought down before uh, elsewhere. So the ASEAN, India, they are bright spots on an Asia horizon. As for China, China started uh, strongly the first quarter of this year, and then growth has lost some momentum, mostly held back by domestically by real estate and uh, local government uh, debt, and also by some of the reshaping of global supply uh, chains. Uh, nonetheless, we expect that uh, China would remain around 5% growth this year. More concerning about China is the medium-term prospects for growth. It, it may drop under 4% unless China pursues structural reforms uh, such as pension reforms, social uh, uh, support reforms, uh, moving more of the uh, money in the hands of consumers to create more consumer-driven uh, growth for the uh, future. Uh, Mrs. Kristalina, how about the, the MENA region? What's your outlook there, given the higher oil prices that we are experiencing lately? Well, what we see is um, some slowdown in uh, MENA vis-a-vis -vis, uh, last year. And this is the trend uh, uh, globally. It is happening in MENA as well. Uh, we also see in MENA the uh, inflation trend being in the right direction. Inflation is slowing down in most countries, not everywhere, but in most countries. Uh, obviously, oil exporting and oil importing countries uh, face different uh, trajectories. Uh, in oil exporting countries, decisions to contain OPEC plus uh, delivery on the oil market uh, have consequences. Uh, so does the increase in price of oil over the last weeks. Uh, when we look into the uh, future for MENA, uh, the problems that are most concerning are of structural nature. As you know very well, youth unemployment is very high, 20, 26% on average, in some countries 30, 35%. The participation of women in the labor market has improved somewhat, but it is still only 29%. How do you get human capital in MENA to be deployed more productively? Is not only a matter of economics, it is also a matter of social cohesion and stability uh, for MENA. So when we work with our uh, partners in MENA, uh, we give a lot of attention to medium-term growth prospects and how those could be improved. Mrs. Kristalina, uh, in a few days you'll be hosting the IMF World Bank meetings in Morocco despite the unfortunate uh, earthquake. What are you aiming to achieve from those meetings? Uh, let me first convey my heartfelt sympathy to the people of Morocco for the disaster they experienced and thank them for their hospitality. Uh, we are bringing the world to Morocco as an indication that solidarity matters. And the main objective of our annual meetings is to strengthen the capacity of the fund to provide that solidarity, especially for vulnerable emerging markets and low income countries. Since the start of the pandemic, we have injected $1 trillion in special drawing rights and lending into the world economy. This is boosting reserves and liquidity at the time countries most needed it. 
to be strong for the future that is going to be, unfortunately, future of more frequent and severe shocks. We need to have the IMF also strong. This is why at the annual meetings, our message of solidarity translates into our membership agreeing on increasing quotas for the fund so we have more capacity to help our members. Very important, getting more resources for concessional finance for low-income countries, zero interest loans for low-income countries. And I'm very optimistic we would be able to do more. And addressing the burden of debt, making more progress on how we can handle debt restructuring in countries that are being suffocated suffocating by, by that burden. Uh, overall, we also want to see together in this more uncertain world, what are the right policies to go forward, recognizing that there is a big divergence, not only in terms of incomes, but also in terms of policy choices, that each country now is marching on its own tune and it is there at the annual meetings that we can bring all of us to march together. So this is your answer to the uh, voices that are questioning actually the relevance of the international organizations like uh, the IMF. Um, how about Egypt? Uh, the, the first review was repeatedly delayed amid questions over Egypt's progress in meeting the IMF terms. When do you expect this to happen and what are the major uh, hurdles? We are engaging very closely with the Egyptian authorities. Uh, there, there has been quite a lot of progress on, for example, bringing more private capital in areas where state-owned enterprises may not be the best uh, um, way to handle the uh, e economic uh, objectives. Uh, there is still some work to be done on the uh, question of how best to allow the exchange rate to move. And I very much look forward to meet the Egyptian delegation when we are at the annual meetings. So we might see the review this year? We are very keen to see progress on the review as quickly as we can resolve the remaining uh, uh, issues and yes, it is possible to have the review done within uh, this year. Thank you so much, Mrs. Kristalina. Thank you for your time and I wish you all the best for the annual meetings. Thank you. Thank you.